नमस्कार वेलकम बैक टू मीडिया स्कैन योर वीक एंड डोज ऑफ हेडलाइंस कॉन्ट्रोवर्सीज एंड पर्सपेक्टिव फ्रेंड्स वाइल द इलेक्शन एनालिस व हॉगिंग द हेडलाइंस अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग बुक और राधे एक्सर्ट्स ऑफ द बुक अपियर्ड अक्रॉस मीडिया चैनल्स टेलिंग अस थ्री इयर्स आफ्टर हिज डिमाइज हाउ फॉर्मर प्रेसिडेंट प्रणब मुखर्जी शेयर हिज एक्सपीरियंसिस हिज ऑब्जर्वेशंस एंड इनसाइट्स इन टू इंडियन पॉलिटिक्स थ्रू हिज डायरी एंट्रीज नाउ दीज हैव बीन कलेक्टेड इन अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग इनसाइटफुल incisive book by his daughter sharmishta mukherjee herself a uh, political worker we have in this very special episode ms mukherjee with us who will be able to share with us why she decided to pen them down for all of us and some of those very valuable insights that form a part of this volume sharmishta mukherjee thank you very much thank you so much smita but before we continue let me correct a small mistake i am no longer in politics so i am no longer a politic a political activist so so thank you for that clarification and then shall we quickly start with that what was that moment or that point in time when you thought politics was not your calling or was there a particular incident which prompted you I will to be very honest I joined politics very late in my life I joined politics in 2014 after the congress debacle and then I thought that as a congress supporter I should come forward and work for the party and I worked uh, for about 5 years uh, but uh, slowly I realized that it is perhaps not my cup of tea because I was uh, a classical dancer and choreographer yes. so from there to you know jump into a very different field like politics so I started realizing my own weaknesses and uh, but i think for me the decisive moment came when after when in 2020 february the delhi election uh, results were declared and congress was decimated once again very badly for the second time and i was involved in delhi politics so i was very very disheartened and uh, the way we fought the election not just a defeat but because i felt ki ye ladai se pehle hi humne hathiyar dal di mm. you know mm. we have surrendered our weapon before the, even the fight began so at that point uh, i remember you know t- telling my father with lot of apprehension asking him baba would you mind if i quit politics so pat came the reply that when did you do politics that you would quit <laughs> <All right. laughs> very interesting <laughs> so um, uh, perhaps uh, it was uh, the position of the party or the fact that you were not very comfortable with all that was going on within in the arena of politics well primarily primarily it's more my own uh, uh, character or my own uh, uh, inability to cope with the uh, world of politics so i wouldn't uh, blame anything else uh, because to do opposition politics and especially at such a tough time you know you need a need a very different kind of mindset mm, mm. and my decision to join politics was very ideological but it was also very impulsive mm. so and at that point my father actually warned me about it you know that probably he okay. felt mm. that i will not be able to uh, you know sustain it because it is an impulsive decision but at that time of course i told my father that no 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 i'm going to continue it but then you know after being in politics of, of, of course i enjoyed i it was a very it's a great learning process but i realized i am not meant for it it's not my cup of tea right so maybe i'll come back to that in a in a while but before that i wanted to you know i was checking out some of the interesting excerpts from the book that you've written what really prompted you to think that you know the diary entries and observation shared by the late president should be you know should come out in the form of a book for people uh, at large and were you also apprehensive that some of the things might become uh, create a problem for you when they came out uh, my father's diaries have been a, a source of curiosity for journalists for many many years mm. because uh, they knew that my father chronicled uh, very regularly you know his thoughts and his experiences in his diaries and he told them you know that you know their diaries are going to be with my da- daughter and it's up to her whatever she wants to do with but you know it was uh, he strictly uh, and he also said that you know it is whatever it is even if it's to be published or something you know it has to be done posthumously and right. he had he even forbade me to read the diaries so i started on reading the diaries only after he passed away 
so it was already there something in my mind that uh, you know i have to write something about him and a couple of times he jokingly told journalists that my daughter is going to write about me so i it was already there in my mind that i knew i had to uh, you know write something about uh, uh, not not only about him about the diaries and in fact while he was alive uh, and in his post presidential years i used to tell him that please start working on the diaries okay you know, why why do you think he forbade you to you know the uh, even are, read yeah, them yeah, till yeah, till yeah, he yeah, wasn't I around you, because diaries firstly are very personal accounts mm. you know nobody forget about being a politician but nobody mm. wants their diaries to be read you know and secondly you know he was um, i mean there are many things in the diaries he just did not want uh, them to be you know come out in public domain till the time he was alive to become a discussion yeah yeah to but discussion. now that the book is out there were you know one of the things which could have become a point of discussion which i found very interesting is the fact that uh, you know you have added in your observations that whenever miss uh, sonia gandhi uh, was you know whenever you learned from your father that she had heaped a lot of praise on him or recognized his services you always felt there was something amiss you know something withholding something going wrong there or there was something more to it and you say that uh, on the other hand i find uh, you know we may call it a trust deficit or a gap in trust but you said uh, this may have a background from the point when uh, the late indira gandhi was assassinated and rajiv gandhi took over as prime minister if you could share with us why do you think that became a kind of a turning point Uh, well i think the two questions are a bit unrelated because first about his sonia gandhi is uh, praising him and then with holding uh, something that he wanted i think that was perhaps in a way sonia gandhi's style of uh, you know softening the blow hmm. and uh, and of course my father has never commented about it anything but this i have seen over a pattern the second question the trust deficit it goes way back in 1984 and that time after indira gandhi's assassination uh, there was a rumor that my father staked his claim to be the uh, interim uh, prime minister but which is not at all true which mm. my father himself wrote uh, at length in his book uh, which i have also uh, written uh, you know about it based on some of his handwritten books uh, mm. handwritten notes, notes. You know, which i have found and uh, so there are you know lot of issues but uh, the, uh, the but fact you think that impression stuck even though it no, wasn't the fact, true no the fact is the fact of the matter is because rajiv gandhi himself was in the flight you know and mm. he was privy to the conversation i mean and my father only told him and the others present also balram chakar uh, 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 and others in presence of others that you know you are going to be the prime minister right i mean uh, we want you to be the prime minister so so that fact of staking claim is completely false it was a rumor and why it was uh, you know like spread like this who planted that's all there in my book i don't want to reveal everything so that our readers will not buy the book fair enough fair enough but uh, you do have a chapter which clearly says pranam mukherjee the prime minister who you know yes i was coming to that uh, smita so the but the fact of the trust deficit my father's own analysis of it what he felt that in the two years of two months of working uh, mm. with rajiv gandhi immediately after uh, uh, the assassination of indira ji yes. so he felt that uh, perhaps rajiv gandhi realized that it was not easy to work with a person like pranam mukherjee who had a very strong mind of his own backed with a formidable combination of knowledge experience and expertise it is but, very it but is very rajiv difficult. gandhi being a, a comparative novice at that point of time shouldn't uh, pranam mukherjee's expertise and experience have been an asset actually well that's something you have to <laughs> you need to ask rajiv gandhi and unfortunately he is not here so that question i can't answer that why rajiv gandhi did it but this is my father's analysis i do tend to agree with him <coughs> that that was the basis of his uh, rajiv's mistrust and perhaps that was also the mistrust of uh, uh, later mistrust uh, with uh, sonia ji not <coughs> complete mistrust but not complete trust also to the extent because they might felt that my father might have uh, might not have told the line so blindly and might have become uh, a source of a challenge to their authority right so that is why you said he was the prime minister we never had 
Well, that's not I say. That's many people say. So yes, I actually, I, pick, been, uh, I, 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 I picked up uh, this uh, th this particular line, this particular phrase from there are many articles, and especially after he's passed away or after many, you know. So this was the headline that Prime Minister India never had. Never had. You know. So but I you actually see, picked up the you line from that. that. <laughs> you you have written, and it's been said for for over yes, over the absolutely. years. Absolutely. You write that he did uh, uh, confess with you, or I would say share with you, that he wanted to be prime minister because when you are in politics, it is everybody's em that is everybody's ambition. But at the same time, he he wasn't bitter about the fact that he didn't get that chance. Very true, uh, Smita. He definitely had the uh, desire of. Uh, uh, becoming the prime minister and he told me very clearly that any serious politician worth his salt has this desire but he also knew uh, he was a mature person he also knew that there are many desires which might not be fulfilled mm. which might not get fulfilled so he accepted that that he will not become the prime minister and he accepted it and he was uh, uh, he just accepted it and moved on in his life. So at the end of it, I but, think, you know, he was... But that could have been his magnanimity or his, you know, uh, no, I think that nature his, to that, accept that was his things. Nature. That was his nature to But accept. you think uh, it was an unjust thing to have been well, done? Just unjust, you know, in one thing I realized about uh, reading Baba's uh, diaries mm. and also through our own life experiences, uh, Smita, you know, we are all mature people. You know, everything in life is not just black and white and there are a lot of shades of grey. True. You know, and our truths also can be, you know, perceived from different sides. So I don't want to comment on this, whether it was just or unjust. That is for the other people to fine, uh, comment. Fine. So you, you just mm -hmm. shared some insight, not too much, about his relationship with the Gandhi family, particularly yeah. Sonia Gandhi ji and Mr. Rajiv Gandhi. But one relationship I found to be really interesting in the book was, you know, for all these years, we had been looking at Pranam Mukherjee as one of the strongest pillars in the UPA government, whose expertise and knowledge, you know, had uh, contributed so much. But uh, there, are, uh, there were issues, particularly on the handling of the Kashmir situation, especially post-Mumbai attack, where it seems Pranam Mukherjee was uh, not in agreement with the policy adopted by Dr. Manmohan Singh, and that uh, finds place in the book in very clear words. Yes, absolutely. And over uh, a course of 10 years, mm -hmm. or even before that, but because my father's relationship with both Dr. Manmohan Singh and Sonia Gandhiji, it is for many years. Yes. So, and when you are, especially, you know, when you are in the government for 10 years and, you know, working under such high pressure situation, so my father would say that it is always, you know, it's very natural to have disagreements. I mean, it's and one of his favorite quotes, I, I mean, sayings was that you do not necessarily need to agree everything every time. So that is having differences is fine. That's normal, natural. But what I found interesting that how they manage the differences. Mm. I mean, what I found that the three key players during UPA 1, UPA 2 within Congress, that is Dr. Manmohan Singh, that is uh, my father, that is... Uh, uh, Sonia Gandhi ji, you know, how they managed the differences. I think for me, that was a far more interesting fact. No, but on the Kashmir situation, you think... Uh, Which Kashmir situation? I don't this think is I have written about the, Kashmir The Sharm al Sheikh. How, you I, know, post-Mumbai, uh, 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 post uh, uh, okay, I okay, found okay, it the interesting. The relationship with, uh, yes. uh, with, uh, uh, with Pakistan. Yeah, and the mention Particularly post-Mumbai. Yeah, particularly post-Mumbai, yes. There was this big, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uproar in the country, in the parliament. Uh, that um, and the sidelines of Sharm el uh, summit, uh, NAM summit. So there was a joint statement by uh, Pakistani Prime Minister, I think Mr. Gilani, and uh, our Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, where there was a resumption of uh, bilateral talks, you know, uh, isolating it from the terror issue, mm. uh, as well as the mention of ba Balochistan mm, for the first time. So that created a row, uh, even within the Congress party also. And my father felt very strongly that it was wrong. It was something, uh, you know, I mean, he came to know about it, how it happened, and which I have written again in my book, yes. which I'm not going to disclose because otherwise who will read the book, who will buy the book. But yes, again, you know, they sorted it out. Uh, I know this has been asked to you again and again, but in the light of the recent assembly election results, you know, there are, there are portions in the book where you share how uh, Pranam Mukherjee 
for a long time wanted Rahul Gandhi to rise as the leader of the party, but he was very disappointed on this count. You have mentioned uh, small, small snippets here and there, the AMPM issue and the question about tearing of the ordinance, which wasn't technically tearing, but it did run he, down, he, he, he run said down the government. He said it should be torn off or uh, so, tra thrash, thrashed off. So uh, uh, how did he look at Mr. Rahul Gandhi when he actually started his political uh, career? And what were his thoughts towards the end? You know, to be very honest, I don't think there were too many interactions between Rahul Gandhi and my father. Uh, because both during UPA 1 and UPA 2, my father was extremely busy with mm. uh, uh, multiple uh, responsibilities, not just handling governments and different, heading different GOMs, but the parliament, managing the coalition. And Rahul was not a pa member of the government. So he was uh, more involved in the party and with his youth congress. So, uh, I mean, there are very few uh, uh, references, uh, but, you know, my father described Rahul as somebody who is very courteous and who is full of questions, and he felt happy that whenever he made a good speech in the parliament, uh, my father would write that Rahul spoke well today. Uh, but he was uh, very shaken, his confidence on Rahul was very shaken when Rahul Gandhi publicly uh, trashed a government, his own gov gov government's ordinance publicly. So he was very angry, he was very, and I was the one who uh, broke the news to him. So he okay. shouted, uh, you know, started shouting at me as if I have done it. So he was very, very angry. And he felt it was absolutely wrong and uncalled for, uh, for Rahul Gandhi to do such a thing. And uh, much later, much later in, uh, after 2014, I think in 2015, uh, one day he was talking to me and trying to explain that, you know, why the debacle happened uh, in 2014. Uh, that is the time he said one of the reasons is that, you know, your own vice president had shown publicly such disdain for uh, your own government's decision, his own government's decision. Why should people vote for you again? Fine. So for him, Correct. this was a like last straw on the canvas back. It became the last yes. straw. But you mentioned 2014, and 2014 became kind of a watershed in Indian politics. Of course, Pranam Mukherjee was already president of India, but we saw the rise of Narendra Modi. He took oath as prime minister. You know, one of the very interesting chapters of recent politics, I would say, through this NDA government period, has been a lot of talk about the relationship between Prime Minister Modi and former President uh, Pranam Mukherjee, both being from two different, you know, political ideologies, political backgrounds, but the kind of uh, mutual respect, and uh, at, two, at one point it became quite the talk of the town, if I can say that. Well, I think uh, the other than the personal regards mm. they had for each other, and uh, which, you know, some interesting stories had been told to me by Mr. Modi also, a couple of them I have... Uh, written in my book, Yes, I think uh, one of the reasons which Mr. Modi only told me that uh, uh, first time he as a president, uh, as a prime minister designate when he met Baba and he was a little uh, nervous and he touched his feet and he sought his guidance, uh, my father told him very clearly that we belong to two different ideological uh, parties and uh, we come from two very different ideologies uh, but the government has uh, the people of the country has given you the mandate to rule governance is the job of the prime minister and his cabinet so i am not going to interfere in that if you need any support in suggestions in constitutional matters i'm always there to help you but very interesting while telling it to yeah. me mr modi himself said the dada ke liye ye baat kehna bahut badi baat thi you know, a person coming directly from the being a you know key uh, uh, key member of another government. So it's not that Baba was a novice administratively. He was a, he was not a novice in terms of go governance. From there, you know, he became the president, and then he is telling that I will not interfere in the president. So I think uh, you know, Mr. Modi also felt that it was a very big thing. And secondly, I think it was my father's own belief of the role of the constitutional role of the president and the constitutional limitation of the president. You know, the, uh, it is not the president's job to interfere to in the interfere. governance. 
And so I think that is the reason. So I for rules. That yes, we absolutely. have seen ourselves while, you know, interacting with him absolutely. in our course of reporting. Yeah. But uh, I just wanted to know from you, you know, uh, your father going to the RSS headquarter as an invited guest had created a lot of furor all around. There was uh, open anger expressed by Congress leaders and Congress workers. And Mr. Pranam Mukherjee very proudly went there, shared his thoughts and came from the event. Did he ever tell you uh, why he accepted that invitation? Well, yes, you know, because... And uh, what did you think when he went Yeah, there? yeah. I mean, my thoughts were very much put in uh, uh, public domain because I tweeted against him. Yes. And in very strong words. And before that event, I was uh, really trying to exert pressure on him to uh, withdraw the uh, acceptance. And I really fought with him. I really, really fought with him. And uh, But he was very clear that he would go because he believed that dialogue is a must in democracy. And I told him that, you know, I repeated one of the arguments doing uh, hmm. round in the Congress and the left circles, that by, go by going there, he's legit giving legitimacy to RSS. Hmm. So he told me very sharply that, who is he? He said, who am I to give legitimacy to R RSS? The right. people of India has given legitimacy to RSS by you know, choosing one of their uh, uh, pracharaks as the prime minister. So you have to accept and acknowledge this fact. And, uh, and in, a, in democracy, dialogue is the only way forward. So you just can't ignore somebody just because you do not believe in that ideology. In that and the part. most interesting fact is that I think my father actually used RSS platform to preach Congress ideology of mm. constitutionalism, of pluralism, of inclusiveness. So, I mean, so Ms. Mukherjee, you know, what uh, sort of comes to my mind is, on the one hand, you are explaining how he tried to argue with, uh, argue with you why he, is, he has chosen to go there. Well, did not he and, argue? He just yeah. snapped at me about that RSS Pracharak thing. Otherwise, he was quite, uh, 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 quite uh, uh, you know, he maintained a silence. Mm -hmm. You know, it was I who was going on, like, shouting at him and, you know, <laughs> uh, fighting with him. So, but it is, you know, when I look back, when I look back, I think, you know, I behaved pretty uh, stupidly and immaturely. Mm. My father was sticking to his belief of to democracy. His, yes. It was I who probably did not really understand the true values of uh, democracy and the true ideology of Congress, which is inclusiveness and which is inclusiveness of different ideas. So you have to have that space for some ideology, even if you don't agree with it. As simple so, as that. So, on the one hand, you have the example of your late father, you know, who proudly went there as a Congress person to the RSS head headquarters. But on the other hand, you know, I've been seeing it's been more than two days now, uh, the kind of backlash uh, on you after the, you know, some excerpts of the book have come out. And we are seeing people trolling you quite viciously. How do you respond to these... Uh, uh, these uh, trolling, this backlash from the Congress party, which you have been a member t until recently. And also, were you expecting this? Well, definitely, you know, I knew that it is going to be, uh, you know, it is going to create some controversy and some of the comments, and especially about Rahul Gandhi, it is, not, it mm. will not be liked by Congress mm. party and fair enough. It's absolutely fair. And as far as trolling is concerned, I'm not even seeing by social media comments. So, you know, if I don't see something, it doesn't bother me. And why Congress is trolling the uh, current Congress party uh, uh, leaders and workers who uh, fight for freedom of speech, who fight for the ha right to have dissent voices mm. uh, of difference of opinion, uh, even criticism, is also a different of opinion. We might not agree. But not they, agree. they have not so, only so, no, no, attacked so why you, they are, have attributed motives to you. So, you know, why they are doing it, it is their problem and perhaps mm. they should introspect that whether they are following their ideology truly or not. That is for them to introspect. That is not for me to answer. Right. So, we are seeing the backlash and the attacks on you and as I said, a lot of political motives are being attributed to you. That you have perhaps uh, having been you are having a rethink on your decision to quit politics and you might be, you know, trying to uh, find a space for yourself in the new political dispensation. You know, firstly, I mean, I have, I'm done with politics 
I'm happy as you can see, you can see my piano, you can see my sitar. <laughs> I am done with politics. And again, as I say, I am one true Congressy, blue blood Congressy. I believe in Congress ideology. You know, whether that ideology is being followed by the current Congress party, you know, whether that true Congress ideology of inclusiveness, of tolerance, tolerance of divergence of opinion, whether that divergence of opinion is being followed by the adherents of today's, you know, the leaders and the workers of today's Congress party, whether they are doing it or not, that question they need to ask themselves. I am very, I very clear that I am a thousand person Congressy, and no, I am not going to join any other party. I mean, forget about any other party, I'm just totally out of politics. And I think a good test of this inclusivity, claims of inclusivity will be if we, if we really see some of the Congress persons and leaders, you know, uh, coming to your book launch, which is going to be <laughs> held very soon. I so, do hope so. Oh, so we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that. But thank you so much, Sharmishta Mukherjee, for you. finding the time to share your insights with us, your observations, conversations with your late thank father. You. Thank you. Thank and you I'm so sure much. this book is going to be a really tell-all. The so what we I have read so far certainly promises that. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you so much.